The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our webinar, Privacy in the Workplace. My name is Julie Dore and I will be your moderator for today's event. Our presentation will last approximately 40 minutes with the remaining time available for your questions. If during the presentation you have any questions at all, feel free to contact me or um, you can use the, actually the instant message that's available on your dashboard on your um, attendee panel or you can email me at julie at the doorgroup.com and we'll answer those questions right away. And I just put that up right now the, uh, about your moderator. The email address is also there uh, listed under my picture, so if it's easier, you can just kind of jot that down and send me an email real quick. Now, of course, we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Um, so if you can either put your questions in the Q&A box or email them to me, we'll hold them until after the presentation is concluded. And then earlier this morning, we emailed you a link to a downloadable copy of our presentation. If you haven't received that yet, feel free to email me right now, and I'll send that document to you right away. And before we get, so get started, please note that this webinar and all of the accompanying materials are protected by copyright and that the entire conference is being recorded. This presentation provides general information only and does not constitute legal advice. We recommend that you consult with legal counsel to address your specific situation. So let's get started today. Um, we have, obviously, our expert panel coming up, and we have Linda Duffy. You know and love Linda Duffy like we all do. She's the president of Ethos Human Capital Solutions. Linda works with business owners and executives to provide strategic human resources direction, develop leadership talent, and increase organizational effectiveness. We also have Ms. Marla Merrib Robinson. She is with the law firm Merrib Robinson Jackson and Clarkson, where she's a partner and head of the firm's transactional department. She primarily practices law in the area of corporate, mergers and acquisitions, real estate, finance, and employment. So we're going to turn over to Linda because we have a very special guest today, Linda Duffy. I'm hoping we don't get too confused with our Lindas today, but I'd like for you to actually introduce our expert panelists today. Thanks, Julie. That would be my pleasure. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our webinar. Um, I am so excited that Linda Zimmer is here today. I have had the pleasure of hearing Linda speak on numerous occasions and on numerous subjects, and she is frankly brilliant. She has uh, been in the marketing area for a number of years, and one of her taglines is that she is wicked smart marketing. I apologize, Julie. I think we are getting an echo here, so I'm just going to hope that it doesn't continue. Um, anyway, so Linda has been working on marketing for a number of years. She recently became certified as a information privacy manager, and that is going to be the topic she shares with us today. So Linda, go ahead and take it away. Thank you, and, and thank you for inviting me to be here, and I'm delighted to be able to share something I feel really passionate about, and as a marketer got involved with because so much personally identifiable information is coming into the workforce, especially through both HR and marketing. <laughs> And we need to uh, get a little bit better about handling this in the workplace. So I'm going to run through some pretty common areas today that questions come up. But first, let me talk a little bit about uh, personal information. Um, and the terms PII, personally identifiable information, privacy, sensitive data protection, and internet security are all kind of intertwined today. So when we're talking about privacy in the workplace today, we're actually going to be covering something much broader than just employee information uh, security. So we're going to broaden this out a little bit and, and talk about privacy in the workplace uh, as, as a, a kind of overarching topic. So let's do a really quick rundown about what our today's discussion is going to be. 
So I want to just dip a little bit into HR's new privacy duties because they're expanding and this is just going to get uglier as time goes on. When we've got something like close to 50% of companies experiencing some kind of data breach in the last year, uh, we, we have to really put this out throughout the organization as something that needs to at least have an awareness um, and, and start building in some really good controls. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the top ways that employees' data gets leaked. And then the other side of the coin is what are employees doing? What are their behaviors that tend to cause leaks? And these two areas in particular touch on HR and the interaction that HR has with employees. And then there's this really complex kind of ugly privacy compliance landscape that's just getting more and more complex. Um, so our best defense is staying on top of some best practices. So we're going to talk through a few of those. Um, so let, with that, let's move on to talking a little bit about some of HR's new privacy duties um, as it relates to today's environment. And of course, we cannot even speak about this without just giving a tip of the hat to the fact that technology is making our jobs um, a little bit more complex, but it's also broadening what HR's privacy duties are. So one of the key things that I see happening today is that more and more companies are putting together cross-functional privacy um, and that must, must, must include the HR uh, function as being a key member of that committee. Um, businesses from across the globe are looking at U.S. companies that they may want to do business with, and one of their due diligence questions is what is the privacy function and how does it function within that company? So HR is being brought in as a very important member of these uh, privacy committees, and even in a small company. This is a key, uh, a key thing to, to be thinking about. And then, of course, the biggest trend that I'm seeing is actually this request and placement for chief privacy officers or privacy managers within the organization. So, of course, HR is going to be responsible for creating job descriptions and recruiting for those positions. So knowing what those positions are is going to be critical as well. And then there's the whole training and awareness of policies. We've got to start looking at our policies from top to bottom and how they relate to governance procedures. Um, and HR has a huge role in that. And then, of course, there's the data breach incident, whether you have a leak or, or um, what we refer to as a breach incident. Um, HR has huge roles in both preventing those and in communicating with employees during that. And finally, there's just the overall corporate, com corporate compliance component that HR um, is, is a, key, a key component in. So those are some of the new duties that are being introduced. But let's talk now about a couple of new laws um, that are going to affect you immediately, and that is as of January of this year. Um, California has the toughest uh, laws in the nation regarding privacy. Um, new legislation in the fall came through. There were 13 new bills that were passed in the fall and signed by Jerry Brown. Um, and because California has such tough laws, they set the model for a lot of federal law that's coming in around, in that, uh, around privacy and data security and protecting privacy. So the, the first one is this data breach notification law, which is brand new, and some really interesting sort of tweaks come about here. Um, if you own or license any information about Californians, you have to maintain, quote unquote, reasonable security procedures and practices. Um, and what's interesting about this is California doesn't care where you're located as a business, but if you are holding, gathering, accessing data about Californians, California believes that you are subject to the California data breach laws and data protection laws. So here's an interesting 
thing. This includes business logins and email credentials, not just things like driver's license numbers or social security numbers. So stop and think about this for a minute. How many of us share a login that has to do with a business email address um, and that that email is actually the username along with a login. Now that may not be to um, access something internally. Maybe it's a Google account, a Google Analytics account, say, or a Dropbox account. Um, keep in mind that technically sharing that is a breach of the notification laws. Of course, that's an extreme example. But one of the things that I want to kind of communicate here is being aware that a business email address and login um, could essentially technically be a breach um, according to some of the new privacy laws that are coming in. So a business email address along with the login is actually considered personally identifiable information. And this gets a little bit more complicated as we move through this and when we talk about um, ways that data gets breached as well. So one of the issues here is that with that breach, you're required to provide 12 months of identity theft prevention and mitigation services, which can run into a lot of money, especially for a small business or a small business owner. Um, the other uh, new law, AB 370, is about collecting personal information online. Um, and this includes job applications. So you need to check what that little tiny privacy policy link at the bottom of your website, if you're collecting personal information via your website or via a vendor, make sure that that privacy policy is current, accurate, about what information is actually being collected and what's being done with that information. So um, interestingly, these privacy policies are being scrutinized by regulators and compared to your practices. Um, so it's really important that those privacy policies be up to date. So let's just take a really quick look now at the privacy compliance uh, difficulty and complexity. I'm not going to talk individually about each of these, but these are issues that, that come up. You know, obviously, employee privacy rights are something that we have to deal with. But you know, there's all kinds of new monitoring devices built into things that we may be employing um, with our, our employees, things like the smartphones that we give them have GPS tracking on them. Maybe you're in a wellness program, and the Fitbit is monitoring and gathering data and tracking. These go right into the privacy rights of, of employees and we have to we have to look at those and and stay close with our business attorneys on on what we're doing in that realm. One of the things that I do want to just touch on briefly is this idea of data processors and transfers. We often use cloud services to move employee data. If we're not holding it in-house, we may be using cloud services providers. And an interesting little twist to this is if we're moving that data from California across state lines or even across country lines, um, we may have new obligations that have nothing to do with U.S. law and everything to do with law in that country in terms of what our obligations are to protect privacy. So you need to be aware of the fact that this data, just because you own it and control it, may mean that who's ever processing that data for you has other privacy obligations that you have to meet or that you have to ensure that they meet. So it becomes really complex and it's not getting any easier. So why is all of this matter? Why does privacy matter? Well, for any business, the average cost of a significant data breach and significant which actually is average, would be about 20,000 records, can cost at a minimum $3.5 million. For many companies, that's uh, a no-brainer. I've got a, uh, that, that, that certainly affects my business, maybe the point of putting me out of business. Um, and if you just look at other things like loss of productivity for an employee that has identity theft, um, things like compliance with regulations, 
forensics where you have to go in and figure out why this privacy breach happened, the costs climb exponentially. And so it's really important for any business to understand that mitigating this risk of privacy protections is key because regulators are really looking at this. And if you've been listening to the news at all, you know that these privacy control, these privacy breaches are happening every minute of every day. So let's go into a, a few things about how employee privacy is breached. Um, these are just a few common things that we're going to look at in slight detail as we move forward. Um, so let's talk about a few of these. So we've got sort of five top things that happen um, and how your employee data may get breached or shared or uh, inappropriately accessed. First and foremost, um, the thing that is the weakest link in all of our security is not IT, it's our employees. And um, that includes employee data itself. So if you look at this slide, 71% uh, of end users believe that they have access to company data that they shouldn't be able to see. That's a stunning number. Um, and employees know what they should have access to and maybe are even uncomfortable with the fact that they can see that information and have access to that information. Um, so there's probably one of the biggest sort of guffaws in this area are what I call special privileges. I see this all the time in healthcare. Um, and one of the big areas that they're grappling with is physicians' access to patients medical records that are not their direct patient. Um, and what's interesting about this is, um, you know, well, doctors feel like they should have access to it because it helps them learn, it helps them understand, um, you, you know, some of the new things, what other doctors are doing. But, and many hospitals and healthcare facilities are reluctant to turn off these special privileges for someone, say, like a doctor, because they should have access to this. And yet, um, that ubiquitous access um, is one of the biggest risk factors. But let's look at it from uh, any other business standpoint. Um, maybe your CEO or COO has access to employee information that they don't necessarily need to have for their everyday operational. Um, as a business owner or as a CEO of a small company, you really need to think about uh, special privileges about whether you really need to have access to that information and if it's worth, based on other things that you may do and people that may have access to your credentials, um, if that's putting data in front of people that shouldn't have access to it. And those shared credentials um, happen for convenience reasons, but it also may give people access to information that they shouldn't have. So let's look at how another way that employee privacy is breached. Um, and this is really kind of fascinating. Um, 3M, uh, the company that brings us uh, sticky notes and, and other things, um, has done a recent study on visual insecurity. How, how many people can see your screen? There was a time when we had privacy filters all the time on our, com on our desktop computers. But we often forget that these screens in mobile areas where we're working, remote, at home, in coffee shops, um, also now make it possible for people looking over your shoulder, uh, people sharing office space with open types of office space, that our screens happen to be a huge source of leaks of confidential private data. So um, it's interesting that we're seeing new kinds of privacy filters coming into play so that people that are working outside the office and um, in close quarters can protect private, private information. So you need to think through kind of what your workspace looks like and where employees are working. So if we go to the next slide about insider sharing, some of the key findings of this 3M report are that, um, I, I mean, if you look at this, um, social security numbers, working with them outside the office, credit card information, trade secrets, medical information, and 
Um, you know, other than internal finances, HR private information is one of uh, you know the most um, used information outside the office that people are using this sensitive information in places that this visual privacy could be breached. And you know, technically, uh, in fact, I know of an incident where um, an employee got fired merely because she reported that she was she got fired because she looked over someone's shoulder and was able to access private medical information. Um, so, you, you know, these can be very life-altering things, both for our company as well as for an employee. But let's look really closely at the bottom of this graphic about <clears throat> policies about working in public spaces. Um, we forget that as HR professionals, many of us are responsible for kind of, you know, making sure that these policies are in place. And if you look at the very bottom, it says most employees report that they either don't know or there is no explicit policy about working in public spaces regarding personally identifiable information or sensitive company information. So with the rampant use of technology and working whenever and wherever, we've got to get our policies in place and in line with the way that people are actually doing business. So let's quickly look at insider sharing, and this is a topic we could do an entire webinar on, but <clears throat> One of the really interesting um, things that happens with employees is the fact that they use their corporate email addresses to sign up for a whole host of things. It could be downloading an important white paper. It could be um, signing on to a Dropbox account or a Google account. And, and merely by doing so, because of the very weird, socially open internet that we have today, much of this information, these credentials, get shared on what we call the dark web. Um, and a recent study showed that you know, nearly half of corporate 500 companies have employee credentials posted on these sites. And trust me, there is a lot of profit in that for uh, leaking per this kind of information. But not only that, these um, wonderful sites that uh, <laughs> help share secrets, also do so for profit. You'll notice here that you know this can all be done via Bitcoin, um, and the purchase and sale of employee credentials is huge, huge billions of dollars for a couple of reasons, tax fraud and medical fraud. Those are the two most, way more than, than credit card information, tax fraud, medical fraud. Um, are the profit motive behind sharing employee credentials. So we need to think about what the, our policies are about using corporate email to sign up for consumer-related information via the web. So uh, let's talk a little bit about this kind of consumer information. Insecure websites are probably one of the chief ways that these kinds of employee information gets breached um, by employees using credentials. But you also have things like we as HR people are more and more turning to technology and cloud services. And one of the things that we either fail to do or fail to think about is the fact that we have to look at obligating the vendor to equal privacy standards that we have to follow as PR professionals. And sometimes we do it within the bubble of our own practices and our own businesses, but we're not also looking at contracts, looking at terms of use, looking at their privacy policies about corporate and enterprise data to enable them or obligate them to the same kind of standards with this personally identifiable information. And we've seen many a technology company being plastered all over the New York Times um, because they breached information that you would normally think that they've got really great standards because they're handling this kind of information. Not true. We can't rely on that. And this, uh, this school um, unfortunately breached this information 
through their own insecure website, not realizing that Google could, if not exclusively or, or especially blocked from certain aspects of their internal network, um, put information online and one poor employee was actually able to find her own W-2 through a Google search on the internet and um, this, this was due to an internal error in which someone forgot to tell Google that they couldn't index that particular area of their um, web server or their web services. So this lack of encryption, leaving things in plain view, um, and inadequate, insecure uh, technical glitches can also take this information and put it out there where it shouldn't belong. And then finally, there's always these accidental leaks. Um, poor Jeb Bush, as he's trying to get ready to run for president, sends out an email um, and didn't redact information out of um, some of the reports. And this is something I see over and over and over again, is that people working from home, working remotely, working in the company, and in a hurry, getting information um, off their desk and into somebody else's hands are not reviewing these documents for personally identifiable information like social security numbers um, or uh, health information or email addresses that um, are in that email. And so it's really important that we make employees aware of this and that things get reviewed um, so that we don't land uh, you know, in some hot water like poor Jeb Bush did with something that he did quite accidentally um, and accidental leaks probably where most information is, is going to get breached. So awareness, awareness, awareness for the employee. So now we turn the corner on what employee behavior is causing these breaches. Um, and number one, it is the use of consumer websites for business. Number one, if you look at this graph in the past 12 months, asking employees, have you moved sensitive information among things like uh, Dropbox, Google Drive, uh, personal email, uh, you know, iCloud services of any kind, um, and mobile phones. Um, you know, huge amounts of this information are being put out on the social web, and this social web is nowhere near as secure as our internal systems. As especially as small businesses, these are cost-effective tools for us to use, but at the same time. Um, there, our corporate security, whatever our protocols are completely gone once this information is being, is being put on these quote unquote consumer sites that do not have the same level of security as our personal choices would be internally. And, you know, along those same lines, we've seen things like internal database keys get shared on something called GitHub, which is where developers share all kinds of interesting information. And, you know, one of the places where this could happen is as we're developing new security protocols and our developers and our IT departments are using some of these same social um, sites to cut work, increase productivity, um, some of this information is leaking out through these quote unquote, consumer level kinds of um, sites and poor Uber, um, something like 50,000 of their uh, contractors' information got leaked, um, which is on top of their CEO having problems with having access to information that he should not have had access to. So we have lots of complexity going on here. Um, and then number, number three is transfer to personal devices. We have almost, we have very little control, honestly, about this, but the advent of mobile devices, iPads, um, uh, tablets of all kinds, our mobile devices, including our laptops, are going with us everywhere. And 56% or somewhere along that, more than 50%, um, have this confidential information on their mobile devices. So with that in mind, um, the next slide shows this wonderful face of this guy who's actually reading the terms and surface, uh, the terms 
of use of some of these apps that employees have either on their business smartphone or their personal device that they're using for businesses. Um, and this privacy project had people on the street go through the apps that they already had on their phone to read what some of these permissions were. And as you can see, it, it's things like text messages, but it goes further. The next slide, um, if you look at the short two-minute video, shows that I give this app permission to send emails without any confirmation or in my knowledge. Um, think about that in terms of being able to review your email for confidential information. Some um, apps allow recording of audio at any time, um, which you have no control over. Um, you know, talk about accidental, accidental dialing. We now have apps that may allow for, especially voice-activated apps that are recording this information, not to mention our TV sets that are starting to do this as well. So these apps are sharing, regardless of confidentiality, regardless of, of this, people are agreeing. They just allow, 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 allow as they put these apps on their small, uh, smartphones um, or other mobile devices. And this is leading to the very kinds of behavior that allow us to lose control of trade secrets, employee information, and any other kind of very sensitive information that is, in, is inside the company. Um, so we've got also things like profit or revenge. And we have no idea really what happened with this Morgan, St Morgan Stanley. But the employee had access and downloaded 350,000 records and put them up on a site for sale. Um, of wealth, their wealth management clients, and they were able to um, find this because Morgan Stanley does, um, as a financial institution, actually has protocols in place where they look at these dark sites for potential information that may belong to them. And uh, this employee, of course, was fired, but this personally identifiable and very sensitive information these clients were put out there. So um, some of that insider uh, profit and how much, and here in Orange County, actually, we had a, a case where um, uh, the FBI found a notebooks and notebooks and notebooks and notebooks of driverless license numbers, employee records, photos, social security numbers in these, you know, those credit card things where, you know, you have the sheets and you just roll through them in binders. Um, of These were hospital employee records. Um, and he was using these for identity theft and medical theft. And um, he, he bought that information from an employee that had access to that information. Um, so obviously, this is big profit. Um, and people are selling this information. So if they have access to it, you're at risk for that. So the least access that, that you can possibly give to individual employees, the better to help protect yourself. So let's just really quickly look at our pyramid. I'm not going to go into all of the various laws, but you do have this stratification of laws, and it's your obligation to know what these laws are. And it ranges from the federal laws through state, through industry, and then there are global laws that you may be uh, that you may be. Um, um, you may have to be in compliance with because you hold employee information or, da or customer data that, uh, from people that live in another country. So we have to know what those global laws are. So if we look at the next slide, um, this is just a sampling of some of the interesting laws that govern both employee as well as employee behaviors about the information that we're holding. So um, we may need policies about paying attention to the CAN-SPAM laws or the child protect online protection laws. And HIPAA is, of course, you all know how important HIPAA is to your employee compliance. Um, but just to talk a little bit about the complexity of this, not only is the Department of Health and Human Services um, and state attorneys general and the Office of Civil Liberties. But these days, in our wellness programs, some of us are starting to use Fitbits and sharing that information 
with our employers. And what's interesting about that is it now puts you possibly under the FCC, the Federal Communications Commission, because that information may use radio waves. And so this gets sticky, it gets ugly, and um, some of these prevent private right of action, but many of the laws also allow people or are allowing people to sue individually. So besides compliance failures, you may have to actually have lawsuits to come in. And then let's layer on top of that, you have international privacy laws. Again, some of these are voluntary, but if you happen to be a company who is safe harbor um, so that other European countries feel comfortable with working with you, um, you may also be um, have to be compliant with these global and international laws. Um, and the EU is an is particularly important for us to think about because it kind of sets the standards for every other global uh, privacy protection uh, framework that is out there. And then finally on this pyramid we've got self-regulatory or industry standards and um, these are some of them. I just want to talk a little bit about what's called the PCI or the Payment Credit Card Industry Data Security Standard. And the reason I'm pulling that one out is because almost every company uh, uses credit card transaction. Of some, you may have employee credit card information for some reasons, but you certainly have customer information. And how this touches HR is the PCI credit card uh, certification that you agree to as an organization uh, has a training compliance component that employees must be trained on privacy protections. And so as an HR pr professional who may be in charge of training, one of the things that you may want to look at are these industry certifications that your company is operating under and whether there's a training component required for that. And um, of the <clears throat> uh, thousands of data breaches of credit card information that happened in the last several years, not one company was fully compliant in this and training happened to be one of the areas in which they were not compliant. So um, just really quickly, because I am running out of time here, is, you know, let's look at some quick best practices. Um, you know, get really serious about limiting access. Um, it's kind of a pain to sit down and really think through who needs access to what information. But if you're saving yourself from a possible 3.5 to 7.5 million hit because of uh, a data leak, it becomes a really important um, aspect of your privacy policies, procedures. Um, so, um, you know, get, get really serious about limiting this access, whether it's physical access or technical access to the personally identifiable sensitive information that you have flowing uh, among all the technologies and all your procedures. It's key. Uh, of course, visual privacy screens can save us a lot of headaches. It's a very simple thing to do, especially with remote workers. And while we're talking about remote workers, do you have policies about working remotely and protecting your screens from inadvertent or that insider sharing of information simply by someone being able to sit at your table next to you while you're working you know, on the beach or in your coffee shop? GPS is everywhere, and this is becoming a really important privacy, uh, uh, both an employee privacy, uh, uh, actually for you, it's really an employee privacy issue with GPS monitoring. And what's great about GPS monitoring are things like being able to wipe a device or locate a device that's been lost or stolen, a corporate device that's been lost or stolen. But at the same time, it also, if you're gathering that information and storing it and keeping it and someone is accessing it, you may also be walking into privacy breaches because you have GPS information in your, uh, in, in your you have access to that information. So it's really important that you get cozy with your business counsel 
on these issues so that you know that you're doing it safely. And in, one of the, in this next slide, I've provided you some questions to ask yourself, just a really simple audit of what your privacy is so you can start thinking through some of these issues. You know, do you have privacy guidance? Um, are you looking at your privacy or at your business council and looking for privacy guidance from them? Look at your privacy mission if you have one. If you don't, maybe you, should, you need one. What are your external privacy obligations for any vendors that you're using? And then are you using some of these cutting edge innovations like Fitbits or um, gaming for privacy or for performance? Um, you know, a lot of these new gaming for performance management and getting employees to share information about what they're doing, and this gets um, posted in a competitive manner, sort of like your Fitbit does. Are we going into privacy issues over that? And uh, you know, one of the best things you can do is look at your what are your bring your own device policies. Do you have a bring your own device policy? If not, it might be time to really look at seriously what are your data breach issues around that. And you as HR professionals can be a privacy advocate, but I really encourage you to appoint someone within your department, if not within the company, to be the person who looks at procedures and thinks about what the privacy implications might be. And one of the best people that can do that for you because they know the compliance, um, landscape is your corporate counsel. So lean heavily on them. And then, you know, gather only what you need. Don't gather more information than you need. In this area, era of big data, we think the more information that we have, the better for us. No, 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 no. The bigger your risk is. So think through, do we need that information? And if we absolutely do, we gather it, but we protect it. And if we don't, don't, don't gather it. Uh, don't gather it. So um, Linda, I know, is going to talk a little bit about records management, so I will leave that to her. Um, and then just uh, talk for just a second about privacy training and some of your resources in that area. Um, you know, it's great that th there's all these compliance employees are really hard pressed to understand it. So, you know, just do tabletop simulations. You know, employee Linda was working uh, and she lost her laptop. What are we going to do about that? And what are some of the things that we that might present us in that scenario? Um, and, you know, there's so much in the news. Use that in your staff meetings to talk about privacy issues. And if you are, are one of those organizations that allow employees to participate, they can be a great source of insight in terms of privacy because they see and know what information they might be uh, have access to that they feel uncomfortable having. And then there are lots of resources, two of which um, are, one of which is Teach Privacy, which has a whole lot of modules and their pricing is based on modules. It's an invaluable resource because they've done all the hard work about making it the training easy for getting employees to really think about privacy, create a culture of confidentiality, and how to really care about this. So I highly recommend that you use this. If you can't afford to use their um, uh, modules in training. They've got a great newsletter. Just sign up for the free newsletter and it's chock full of great best practices, great information, and great resources. And then finally, our great FTC, who oversees a lot of the privacy protections in the workplace, is also a, has a wealth of information about the risks as well as some of your best practices in terms of privacy. And these are all 100% free. And if you go to the FTC and just search for bulk publications, B-U-L-K, bulk publications, uh, you'll get a whole bunch of these pamphlets and training materials and awareness materials that you can download for free. So I'm going to wrap that up and hand it back over to, to Linda and Marla. Thank you.
Thanks so much, Linda. Marla, I think you are up now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Linda Zimmer. Uh, as always, every time I hear you speak, I learn something new. You know, despite the fact that lawyers, we've, we've been dealing with confidentiality issues since we've been around, but these new ways of carrying it, such as the mobile devices, changes everything. I'm going to be real brief because I know Linda Duffy has a lot more to cover than I do. But one of the things that you, as a company, want to protect are your trade secrets. California has adopted the Uniform Trade Secret Act, and the slide here has the definition of trade secrets. It requires both of these items. It has to have independent economic value from not being generally known, and two, is the subject of efforts that are reasonable under the circumstances to maintain its secrecy. I want to give you a couple best practices for no item number two. And the first is that if you do have something you believe to be a trade secret, that someone at the company marks it as confidential in whatever form it's in, if it's on paper, if it's online. It must be marked confidential. You must restrict access to it to only those who have a need to know. So if you have, for example, a customer list, then, then only certain departments would need to know that customer list. Salespeople certainly, maybe accounts uh, receivable, but accounts payable might not, um, depending on manufacturing might not. So it, you don't let everyone in the company see what might be a trade secret. Limit it to those who need to know. You might even limit access to certain areas of the company to certain employees. Not all employees are allowed to go into research and development. I've been told that Oakley does this. Um, the, probably the most famous trade secret of all is, was the Coke recipe. I think eventually it leaked out, but for many, many decades it was kept under lock and key. Use written agreements with respect to trade secrets. If you do disclose them, use non-disclosure agreements um, with third parties. Uh, with employees, let them know what their confidentiality obligations are with both respect inside the company and outside with third parties. There are two other labor codes, uh, uh, two labor code sections I just wanted to bring to your attention too because they're not real well known. Uh, 230C, which protects employees who are victims of domestic violence, sexual assault and stalking. The code section actually has a requirement that the employer maintain confidentiality of these issues and the absences related to the issue. So we need to take extra steps with that. And then Labor Code Section 1040 that protects employees who reveal a problem with illiteracy. Again, unusual, the statute specifically states in the language of the statute that the employer must make reasonable efforts to safeguard the privacy of the employee. And Linda can talk to some of the best practices and how to do that. I'm going to turn it over to Linda Duffy. Thanks so much, Marla. And First, let me just apologize to everybody about our slide movement today. Um, I don't know what's going on, but between me and Julie, we're having just a heck of a time trying to move the slides and keep up um, and have them on the right page. So Julie, if you could move um, to the next page, I would really appreciate that. So last year, Marla and I did a webinar on uh, record keeping and retention. So I just pulled a couple of slides of that. So like Linda mentioned, I just wanted to address um, a couple of best practices. So you can see all the things here that typically we would put in a personnel file. But one of the questions to consider is, you know, how many personnel files does one need? And some companies really like to split these out in terms of having like a medical file and having a confidential file, having a payroll file, having a personnel file. And at the end of the day, I think you really have to say, you know, who has access to these files and how many do we need? At what point in time does somebody come in and have access to a personnel file that would require you to pull out other information and you know what, Linda, information they wouldn't have access to? Linda, and, can I just stop you just for a second? We're yeah. having an echo in the background. And Marla and Linda, if you're both on, can you mute your phones just so we can make sure we can hear Linda clearly? I apologize. If we're going to have technical issues, we might as well throw another one in there. Let me try that again. I'm sorry, Linda. Go ahead. I'm sorry. That's okay. We always seem to have some some technical issues someplace. Anyway, so think about who needs access. You know, usually if a manager say is considering um, transferring an employee into their department, maybe they're going to go look at files. But for a lot of smaller employers, I don't think it's necessary to have multiple files. So just think about you know who's going to actually access them. The other question to think about is, are you going to store these with a hard copy, or are you going to try to do this electronically? Are you going to keep them at your office? Are you going to have third-party storage, especially for termination files? 
Um, some of those are the things you want to think about, you know, and just are the files secure, both from people, you know, in the company, people outside the company, and then what about things like natural disasters? So consider all of those issues. Of course, there's going to be some things that you don't want to keep uh, in the files at all. So for example, um, anything that's going to denote uh, race, for example, any EEO information, if you are subject to an affirmative action plan and you're having people fill out data records, or if you have over 100 employees and you have an EEO one you have to report, you know, keep those data records separate. You know, information from background investigations, uh, reference checks, those type of things can be pulled out. I-9 forms, I think everybody knows, hopefully, you should keep those out of the personnel files and usually I suggest a three-ring binder. And then um, some medical insur insurance information, drug testing results, workers' comp claims, all of this stuff can be pulled out and put into a separate confidential file. I personally don't feel the need to break that down into multiple files. Usually I'm going to have a personnel file and then a medical file and then the I-9 form separately. But that's completely up to you. Just don't create you know, more of a problem than you actually need um, to create. So just one other comment about the I-9 forms and, do and document retention overall. Um, remember on the I-9 forms, you have to keep them for one year beyond employment and a minimum of three years. So what that means is if I hire um, Julie to work for me and um, she's there for six months, then I still have to keep it for another two and a half years after she leaves because I have a minimum of three years. If she works for me for three years or more, I still have to keep the form for one year beyond uh, her termination date. So come up with a system where you're going to purge those on a regular basis because uh, if somebody comes in to do an audit, you don't want to give them access to forms that you don't need to hold on to because uh, those forms get really tricky. Uh, to fill out and very expensive. We audit forms like that all the time, and I've never once gone into a company and audited their I-9 forms and found them to be correct. Um, there's a hefty fine, uh, fines that can be imposed on those forms. And then overall, there's multiple levels of how long you should keep different documents. And when Marla and I did this webinar before, which you can go out to our YouTube channel and do the whole thing if you want, um, what basically we bottom lined it for you is to say keep these for seven years. Keep everything related to, to um, employees at least seven years, and then after that you can purge them with one exception, and that exception is because you have exposure to um, toxic chemicals and it's their toxic materials, then you have a requirement to keep your record 30 years beyond employment. Yep, that was the 3-0. So 30 years beyond employment. So with that, um, let's if there's any questions and answers. I know we're running really late today, but Linda, that was such valuable information. So let's see if we have people that uh, have some questions for you. And we do indeed. So again, real quickly, if you want to ask a question, just use the interactive Q&A feature that's on your dashboard. Just click your, your cursor into that open space and type your question, and I will ask it of Linda, Linda, and Marla. Um, let's start first with Felipe. She has a question about um, basically including, and it's actually I think has to do with your third party um, service providers that you were talking about, Linda Zimmer. Um, mm -hmm. She uses a payroll company which will send, which they in turn send via email all of the new hire information including name, social security number, phone number, status, married. How do you suggest that they send that information over to them so they can complete that payroll process? Uh, excellent question. <clears throat> um, first of all, ask, uh, and the way I'm understanding the question is that the company needs to send this to the payroll provider. Um, and the best thing to do is to ask the payroll provider if they have a secure slash encrypted place where uh, Dropbox basically, quote unquote, um, that you can upload that information to them as opposed to sending it through email. email if you are going to use email, um, then it must be encrypted email. And there are uh, encrypted services or your IT department can help you with that. Um, but the best way is to rely on the payroll processor because they often have um, secure ways where you can deposit that information for them. Um, other. Uh, um, other payroll providers um, actually ask you for your login information and they will go and actually pull it from a pre-existing um, uh, 
uh, payable provider. Um, that's the next way that you can do it. Obviously, you're sharing credentials, but um, that's more secure than sending it through email. So avoid email at all costs. If you must use it, it must be encrypted. Okay, Linda, good. let me ask you a follow-up question to that. So I think what Felice was asking is there's a requirement that you, um, obviously as you hire new employees, that you send certain information to your payroll provider, um, and there's like a registry form that has to be sent, things like that. What if there's no secure way of doing it on the uh, payroll providers, and is he allowed to create a Dropbox and give them access? Yes. You can do that. The one question that you need to ask your Dropbox provider is if the information is encrypted while it's sitting on the server. And the next question is, is it encrypted end to end? Most of them are doing that these days. Um, in the last year or so, most of them have gone to encrypting what we call data at rest so that when the data is sitting on the server, it's encrypted. So just be sure that the, the Dropbox provider that you're using is encrypted. OK, good. Anybody else, Marla or Linda, Duffy, do you want to add anything to that? OK. Nope. OK. Um, Toby wants to know, is salary information considered confidential? Uh, the answer to that in, is in the US, yes, it is considered confidential, and Marla can jump in on that if I'm incorrect, but interestingly, um, your salary is a matter of public record in certain European countries. Um, so if you, for example, are, um, uh, you hire a contract employee from Sweden, uh, that information may be public record in Sweden. Um, and it may be stored somewhere and accessible by people um, in Sweden, um, which could also make it accessible to someone here in the United States if that's something that is accessible by the web. So it gets kind of sticky and complex. Marla, do you want to comment on that? Yes, please. Um, it, it is confidential here in the, in the US. However, this is where employers often make a mistake. It's, it's the employee's right to keep it confidential or to disclose it. So you do not have the legal right to have a policy, and many try to do this in their handbooks, which prohibits employees from talking about what their salary is or their wages are. Um, that's expressly prohibited under the, NL, or, you know, the National Labor Relations Act. So you, you have to be very careful. Yes, you have a duty to protect it as confidential, but if the employee wants to disclose it on their own, it's their, it's their right to do so. OK, great. Um, we have one quick question before we have to wrap up here, and it's from June. And June's hoping that, Marla, you'll certainly uh, provide a privacy policy or best practices for your clients on this. But the other part of her question is, should we include information in our employee handbook on this whole privacy issue? Yes. <laughs> Short answer, June, yes. <laughs> OK, good. Great. Well. Unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Linda, Marla, and Linda, thank you so much for helping us better understand how to handle privacy in the workplace and some of the things, ways we can protect ourselves. Um, this does conclude the presentation portion um, of our webinar. And Linda, I'm going to ask if you would like to wrap things up for us today. Yeah, absolutely. If you can move the slide, because I can't seem to be able to. Um, okay. Yeah, so we've got um, just two quick things. We've got an anti-harassment training for managers coming up. Um, this is going to be a webinar on April 9th. So if you have more than 50 employees in your company in California, then every two years you have to provide your managers and supervisors with anti-harassment training. And within six months of them joining the company um, or moving into a manager role. So if you're interested, you can follow the link there to register them. And then finally, Julie, one more slide to go. Um, our next webinar is going to be on employee performance management. And that's both from a measuring and disciplinary side as well as a motivational side. So you'll see the link there. Um, all, of our web, all of our email addresses are there, and you all have the handouts. By all means, please reach out to Linda Zimmer if anybody has any questions about privacy issues. I know she's more than willing to help you um, talk through those. Or if you're interested, she certainly can be engaged to come in and help review your company's practices. Um, from a privacy standpoint, marketing standpoint, anything like that, and help you put better practices in place. 
So thanks again for joining us today, and we look forward to seeing you on our next webinar.